you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Maybe Paris, uh, the Bahamas, uh, maybe somewhere out west, or maybe in the, in the days we've been living in, maybe you would just like to see some family face to face. Well, according to the Travel Channel, the top five places that people would, would, would travel to, that they would choose, are as follows. Number five, Orlando, Florida. Number four, Miami, Florida. Number three, London, England. Two, Cancun, Mexico. And the number one destination is interesting because, because it's, it's the same answer that Paul would give if he was asked the question, if you could go anywhere, where in the world would you go? The number one place that people chose was Rome. And so here we are. Uh, journeying in to Rome. And, and Paul, Paul, as we would see, he would eventually reach Rome, and, and we learn from history that he was actually martyred there. But when writing the, the letter to the Romans, um, Paul had, had not actually been to Rome yet. Paul is, is expressing his passion and um, his, his, his eagerness to reach Rome, um, but it had not yet become a reality because because Paul did not plant the church in Rome as he did many of the other churches that he writes letters to. So when he writes the book of Rome, he wasn't, he wasn't writing to necessarily address a particular issue as he did in, in Corinth or, or Galatia. He was, he was writing to lay the groundwork of what he hoped to be his ministry there. He, he was writing a basic, a basic theology to, to the people who met in small group churches, in, in homes. They met in homes. He was writing a basic theology to to give to the people who were worshiping together in what was then the most important city in the known world. And that's part of what makes, makes this letter so important for us today. For you see, the circumstances surrounding the people in Rome, the circumstances looked a little different than they do to us now, but the basic theology, the groundwork that Paul laid um, is unchanging. It applies to us today just as it did to those who worshiped in Rome. And so let's dive into our first text um, for this journey through Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 11. Romans 1, starting in verse 11. We're going to read through 17. We're going to stop along the way. Verse 11 says this, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. You see, Paul's not, not, not just being nice. Um, he, he longs to be with them. He has this, this longing in his heart as minister to the Gentiles to reach this most important city in the Gentile world. He has this, this, this deep longing to, to commune with these people here. And he continues in verse 12, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This is the Apostle Paul, well known in the now uh, expanding Christian um, uh, circles in the, in the church that follows after Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul, and he says, listen, I want to come to Rome not just to encourage you, but to be encouraged by you. You see, Paul in humility understood that life together matters. That's why we, that's why we gather together in contexts like these. In, in small group communities because we be, believe, as Apostle Paul writes here, that, that life together matters, that we mutually encourage one another to grow in our faith, to care for one another. And we see that the Apostle Paul longs to be with these people to be mutually encouraged. He continues in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. And if you read through the book of Romans, you will see that, that Paul talks a lot about, about Gentiles and Jews, and, and um, he, makes, he makes clarifications that, that the gospel does not differentiate between the two groups. And there's a lot that could be said about who were the Gentiles and, 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 and things we could say about them, but, but in short, the Gentiles, the Gentiles are us. We, most of us watching this today are not born of, of Jewish descent. And so the Gentiles includes us. And that's why the book of Romans is, is such good news for us today, because, because that means that the gospel includes all of us. The gospel is open to all who will hear and believe and receive. We are invited in. And he continues in verse 14. Um, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. I want to take a moment here. This, this idea of being obligated. 
Paul basically is, it, it, that could be translated as, Paul exclaims, I am a debtor. I am a debtor. Have you heard that phrase before? He says, I'm a debtor to carry the gospel that God has imparted to him. He says, I'm indebted to take this gospel and to deliver it to you in Rome. I feel a debt to God to deliver this good news to you. I am obligated. And so similarly, I hope as, as, we, as we journey through this, we will see that we are debtors to the world, to those around us, to our neighbor, to those we work with. And, and even though we're not apostles and we're not all preachers and teachers necessarily, we have the gospel given to us. We, we've been given it and we have no right to keep it to ourselves. And so we too are debtors and that, that to take this good news and to share it with those we come in contact with, just as the Apostle Paul exclaims. And so here we're getting into the meat of, of this first session and what sets us on our course as we journey through Romans. Verse 15, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. And verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We're going to stay here and we're going to dive deep. Verse, verse 16 is, is a critically important verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Most commentators say this is, this, is, this is the book of Romans. This is the letter to the Romans wrapped up in one verse. This is, as, as many of you believe, remember um, in writing class, this is the thesis to the letter that's about to be unpacked. Verse 16 is the thesis to the letter to the Romans. And Paul introduces five important concepts here. Five important concepts that'll, that'll help guide us as we unpack the rest of this letter. The first one is this, that there is something called the gospel. Now, if you've been around church at all, um, you've heard that term used. And, and some, of, some of you may just think in your mind it's the reference to the story that, 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 that Jesus came. And yes, that is it. But, but Paul's going to unpack it in a much fuller and richer way. There's something called the gospel, good news, good tidings of God's kingdom. Two, it is something for which about one might be ashamed. And we might be confused, like, what is Paul talking about here? I'm unashamed of the gospel. We're going to unpack that a little bit more in a minute. Three, the gospel is the power of God. Not that the gospel has power, but the gospel is the power of God. It's the, it is the power of God. Imagine the implications for that, for those who Paul wrote to in that day, but also for, for our world today. That the, that the proclamation, that the good news, that the, that, the, that the gospel is the power of God. It, it, it's his mighty work. Um, in the Greek, it's, it's dynamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. How cool is that? that? That the gospel is the dynamite work of God. And number four, the gospel brings salvation. The gospel brings salvation. It, it comes through the gospel. Salvation comes through the gospel um, by faith through grace, which we're going to look at. And the fifth thing, uh, the fifth concept that Paul presents is that the act of being saved is a promise made to a particular group of people who you might ask, everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. What does that mean to believe? It's not this intellectual um, assent that, that, yeah, I believe something in my mind. It, 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 this word here in the Greek means to commit to, to, to put my trust in, to hope in, to put my faith in. For everyone who believes, salvation is promised. And then he concludes in verse, verse 17, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And Paul's going to unpack this idea of faith and salvation throughout the letter. But, but to show the sweeping, the sweeping act of the righteous power of, of God's saving work, he actually here references the book of Habakkuk and quotes quotes chapter 2 verse 4 so he pulls from the Old Testament prophets here to show the, the 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 sweeping saving work of God's righteousness even at work to those who he is writing to in Rome and so as, as you consider these these five declarations made in Romans 1 verse 16 Romans 1 1 6 what stands out to you have you ever have you ever thought about this idea of, of being ashamed of the gospel I mean Initially, when we hear that, we're like, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
Why does Paul introduce the gospel as, as the power of God? Why didn't he just say that? He could have just said, and the gospel is the power of God for salvation. But he doesn't do that. That's not what he says. One pastor said it this way. There's no sense in declaring that you're not ashamed of something unless you've been tempted to feel ashamed of it. Wow. Can you, can you think of something in your life? Maybe it's not the gospel immediately, but, but there's, no, there's no reason to say I'm not ashamed of that unless there's been a temptation to feel shame, to feel ashamed about that particular thing. I can say that that's true in my life. And Paul undoubtedly knew this temptation when it came to the gospel. He knew and, and says later in his letters that the cross was, was foolishness to some and a, and a stumbling block to others. So Paul had felt this temptation, this, this good news that he proclaimed, this, this freedom that he proclaimed. He had felt the temptation to feel ashamed of it as many, many ridiculed him because of his preaching. And so how would you tell by, by observing someone's life if they were ashamed of the gospel? How would you examine that in your own heart? Have you ever, have you ever acted ashamed? And if, if so, uh, why do you think that that was? If the gospel is such a wonderful thing, and it is the very power of God, who would be ashamed of it? I mean, think about it in today's, in today's time. Let's, be, let's make a relevant example. If you had a surefire way, a surefire cure for the coronavirus, I'm sure you wouldn't keep it to yourself, right? No, you'd be letting that thing loose. And so it's, it's th with this power of God, the salvation that comes through the gospel, if we have that, why not let it loose? We wouldn't want to keep that from others. And Paul, Paul uh, he doesn't conclude with this idea of being ashamed because he, he introduces it and, and we have to reckon with it especially in our own lives, but it's not the way Paul would want us to conclude. So he continues, why is he not ashamed? The same reason that you and I should not be ashamed. He concludes with one idea, saving power, saving power. Verse 16 again, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. God's saving power is why the apostle Paul is not ashamed of the message that he proclaims and the message that he desires to preach to the Romans. So what about this, this power of God? What, what does that look like? What does it look like in your, uh, in your life, the power of God on display? In my experience, it, there are moments where you see the power of God in a moment, and then sometimes it's a process. Sometimes uh, growing up, I've seen healings and, and happen immediately. I, I've seen healings happen immediately through prayer and anointing. And I've seen things happen over time. I, I, I've seen God working in situations where it seemed like the odds were stacked against the favorable outcome. But to me, I, I see God working most powerfully in those situations. And so what does it look like? In my life, I've seen God uh, instantly deliver me from temptations and from sins that held me bound. And in some works, it was a process until God had my full surrender. And some of you have heard my story. I'll, I'll keep it brief. I saw the power of God on display um, when my son was born. He was born under respiratory distress, um, wasn't breathing, um, immediately put to CPAP. And, and, and all I could pray was, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I, I, had, no, I had no other words, but, but I saw God work mightily in, in the first 24, 48 hours of his life. And now we have a, a beautifully healthy one-year-old running around the house causing chaos. I've seen the power of God on display. And so... As we conclude this week, when in Romans, we've begun the journey, when in Romans, stay a while. Breathe deep and allow God to open your heart and mind to what he wants to show you and how he wants to lead you in, a, in your life with a, a, a richer understanding of the gospel. And as we look to our next time together, um, especially during, uh, during the year of 2020, if you ever ask yourself the question, how can I hope? How can I hope at a time like this? Where does hope come from? We're going to unpack that together in session two. But until then, dive deep and keep the faith.